Uh, hi everybody, I'm Sally. Hi. I've been coming to this meeting six years, so it's, it's finally pretty scary and, and also an honour to be up here. Um, so I'm just going to start with a bit of an analogy sort of thing that happened to me uh, a week ago. Um, I, I hurt my foot really bad. I sort of kicked this stick and, and I've now got an abscess on my, oh no, sorry, a cyst on the tendon on the top of my foot. And so instead of going and getting it fixed, I've decided to uh, just wear more comfortable shoes that don't rub it the wrong way. And um, yeah, it's getting pretty painful. And um, yeah, I thought I'd use this as a bit of, as a bit, bit of an analogy because I feel like this cyst that's on my foot is a little bit like my past, you know, it's, it's in there and I'm trying not to deal with it. But um, no matter what shoes I wear, my shoes are kind of a bit of a metaphor for people in my life. They're all going to rub me all different ways, but you know, some are going to hurt more than others and, and sort of flare things up. And um, anyway, I find like Al-Anon meetings, they're great for bringing your attention to your cyst. Um, they are. <laughs> and how to care, care for you. But the step work, I find that that's actually the place that opens you up, helps clean out the wound and allows you to heal and give you the tools so that when you walk through that garden again, you're going to like be a lot more careful and not hurt yourself. So, um, so what is my cyst? What's, what's caused this pain and discomfort for me um, in real life uh, with this? Um, well, my parents are my qualifiers and they're the people that I've picked up so many terrible survival traits that are doing me such a disservice as an adult. They're just not working for me anymore. Um, so I, the ma main qualifier is my dad and my stepfather that are in my life. Um, uh, my, my, first, my dad, he was the type that when uh, he got drunk, he became very abusive. And so my early childhood memories are always under my covers crying and well, I can hear my dad trying to choke out my mum, slamming her against the walls, breaking her bones in her bodies. And, and it became, uh, my, my mum finally divorced my father when my dad's brother murdered his wife from being drunk and he poured petrol over and set her alight. And mum's like, fuck, I've got to get out of this because this is going to be me next. So she ended up um, remarrying to a, another man, a Dutch arrogant asshole man. <laughs> who, instead of hitting her, he decided when he was pissed off, he would hit us instead. We would take all the full brunt of that. And, um, yeah. And my mum was worried at first. You know, she's like, oh, my God, my kids have never been hit before. But then she started turning a blind eye to it. And, you know, and that's when I felt my first betrayal of, of trust and not feeling loved and cared for. I felt alone and isolated and I had this fantasy that someone was going to save me. Maybe my dad was going to save me, my, my, my first, my real dad. Or, and there was also the fact that as an adult, just frustrated thinking, why on earth did no teacher even notice? I had bruises on my body, like I needed to go to hospital. There were, I had been also hit on the head so hard that I had thick blood oozing down my body. I have a brain, a severe brain injury from that. Um, I, yeah, so my stepfather, we had a military style upbringing. It was pretty brutal and um, he was terrifying. He was like the sergeant and um, he hated children. He said that children were meant to be seen, not heard. And, and um, yeah, I, I never got told from, from the time my mum remarried, never got told I was loved. I never got played with. I never got individual attention. I never felt important. I was just another cog in the wheel to make sure that dinner was on the table, the house was clean, and my parents were happy. Um, so I learned to be invisible because... Um, this, and I learned not to speak up because that done, done me such a disservice. Um, bringing attention to myself, I learned that had really bad survival... Um, so it had really bad consequences. Um, um, I remember in primary school telling my mum that I'd been that was constantly being sexually abused, and huh, my mum brushed it off, and and she 
didn't believe me. And I was also too frightened to tell my mum about some of my injuries because I thought that I would be unlovable if I was bringing attention to myself. And it's just like, I was a child who had every ounce of confidence shredded from me. Like, oh, it makes me emotional, just, you know, just, just thinking about that poor little girl. Like, oh, um, so I didn't have, I didn't make my first friend at school until, the, until year 12. So I sat alone. I was made every single person that was in my life my high power, no, 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 no authority figure, sorry. Um, and the fact that no one wanted to talk to me, I thought I was a piece of shit. Um, and yeah, I believe that that was something, something wrong with me. So I learned to escape anger and disappointment by being perfect and um, not causing any problems. And I just became like this real big people pleaser. Um, and my confidence was tied what, to what people thought of me. Um, so I had absolutely no basis of a loving relationship in my life. Most of the guys that I dated were just cheated on me all the time and I kept taking them back um, because I felt that if, you know, I was just scared of people leaving me um, and basically all my, all my siblings that I grew up with, they're all severe junkies now. They are, um, they've had, had most of their kids taken off them. Um, and, you know, I was starting to head down that rabbit hole myself of going, I know something's going to bad if things don't change because I'm, I'm a mess. And then um, I met a guy who um, was a sober, sober alcoholic and he was actually the most normal, like good, honest person that I'd ever met. And he thought I was a basket case. Um, um, you know, he didn't, I didn't think he was going to take our relationship seriously, um, but um, he told me that if you want to, if you want to date me, then, then you need Al-Anon, like go to Al-Anon. And I went to Al-Anon to people please him. <laughs> I was like, okay, if this keeps the guy, I'll go. Um, and in that room, I identified with the lady that was speaking there, it was at the farmer's market woman's meeting. And she talked about this black hole. Her whole childhood was like this black hole. She just didn't remember it. And when I'd come into al I was just like all about the highs. Like I just wanted to just have fun, have fun, have fun. Don't want to talk about anything emotional. Just always ran away from that. And all the stuff that I told you all kind of started coming to the surface. I'd actually forgotten about half the stuff that had happened. Like, I was baffled. And, um, and I was in the, in the shower and the, the water was trickling down my head and I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear my own thoughts. Like, just everything was quiet. And, and I just realised that this is the place that I need to be. Like, I just lost it, dropped to my knees and cried and surrendered to this program. Um, because like I had become a, a full-blown people pleaser and I was making all my decisions were all fear-based um, and I just wanted everyone to be perfect so that you just like me um, and what I realized going into these meetings is that no one is gonna save me I had to let go of that and realize that if I want to be saved I have to do it myself um, and so the first year of, I've got a minute, whoa. Well, if you stay back in the next part of the meeting, I'll finish the full story. <laughs> I, get, I get another share halfway through this meeting. Um, but anyway, my, uh, my first year, my emotions were, were calibrating. I became so mad and um, I was just, uh, but I, I allowed myself to cry, to feel, to, to have all those emotions. And I got a sponsor um, who was so confident. She just walked around this room, hi everybody. Like, I was like, who is that? Like, she's confident. And I was like, I, yeah, she's been amazing. Like all the phone calls and stuff that I'd have with her. She 
when I was having issues with my, my partner, she, she's like, you're a strong woman. You're confident. You don't need to be treated like this. And just like all those things I needed to hear because I didn't believe in myself. Um, in my first three steps, um, I found what God was. Cause, okay, so I'll finish the next part on the next part of the meeting. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, I meant to pick a topic. Uh, I don't have one. I just would love... Oh. How do you how do you even follow up a story like that? I mean, I remember a guy once tricked me and uh, told me he was only a few years older than me. Turned out he was 17 years older than me. Ugh, but, like, that's not... I didn't marry that guy, thank God. He left me $20,000 in debt. Um, so, back to where I was up to with my story. Uh, basically... <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I came in here and like during the, f- the first, uh, the first three steps, I found my God, I had this, had this massive hole I was walking around in my, in my chest and, and I was filling it with all these other crap just to try to make myself feel happy. And once I actually filled that missing piece with God, like just everything started to fall into place for me. Um, and you know, on step four, I, you know, had a started putting the principles into action and taking a fearless look at myself and clean out the garbage and um you know step five reversing my way old ways of thinking yeah basically i i've worked all the 12 steps and when i first came in here i found was it the step four was like the real like real hard one to get over it was like like look yeah um one of the things that was really interesting was that I thought a lot of stuff was my fault. And when I was going to make, make my amends, you know, there was stuff to my father, to, um, you know, previous boyfriends. Just, there was a massive list. Turns out she's like, oh, my God, Sally, no. Um, she goes, I, there was this thing of, like, I didn't have to make am- amends to these people, they were the ones who'd actually hurt me, but I had it twisted in my head that I was the one who did everything wrong. And so that was, um, that was like really great. Um, so um, when I first also came into meetings, I started off in just Al-Anon and I felt like I didn't belong in Al-Anon because I wasn't stopping someone from drinking. Um, my husband was sober. I'm living in another country to my parents, so I don't have to deal with that anymore. Um, but I can't, where I sort of found my, wow, it's fast. Um, where I've sort of found my sense is that I've got a toddler and, and it's amazing how these little guys are, you know, very selfish, self-centered, unpredictable, violent, emotionally unstable and irrational. And so, um, I get to practice my, my tools on on my toddler while I'm here and and it's it's really great for me, you know, not to take to take things personally. Um, and you know, I see I hear all the stories about everyone's childhoods that's happening here, you know, they're not seen, not heard, not felt loved. You know, everything that I hear, I'm like, tell me everything because I don't want to do I don't want my son to turn out like I don't want my son ever have to come into these rooms because you guys are giving me the pathway of to, to create a new, you know, a new path for my, for my son. Um, not only with just my own experience and my recovery and not being irrational and crazy at home, but to hear everything, it's, it's amazing. Um, and, you know, since coming into, into these rooms, it's, it's like this beautiful beautiful good virus that spread through my family like my my mum has now gone into mum's now in program um you know a couple of my sisters are all in their respective programs too that I'm not I'm not going home and fixing and changing everyone's battles like it's actually like really happy and it's because they've seen the changes happen with me and they're kind of curious like what's what's going on like why are you so different and um you know it's it's really great. I also was able to sit down with my stepfather and and have that and have that talk that um, you know, growing up that I, I feared him, that 
I, you know, not in a, <laughs> you did a bad thing, but just like in a really open hearted, hearted way that he never played with me, never told me he loved me, you know, just all that sort of stuff that I talked about before. And he's like, oh shit, I, I just had no idea. I mean, there were just so many of you kids running around. So I'll wrap up. And, um, and you know, he talked about his own upbringing with his father and how horrible it was. And um, I was able to get so much compassion for that man because he was doing the best of what he could with the tools that he was given. And he actually never, never touched me again. And he actually is very respectful to me now. And he tells me he loves me and cuddles me all the time. And just, I feel like doing these 12 steps and coming to these meetings that I'm getting my happy, like happy ending that I have tools, like I'm like a, what's that? Um, ninja. Yeah, ninja or like, I'm in the matrix and I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> and it's so much more serenity. It's so great when you work the steps, finish them guys, like do it, just please. Um, and I'll leave it at that, thank you.